How about those kids? I'll give them another round of applause. Yeah. I know a lot of us will remember that uh, last part there, the standing on the promises. We don't, a lot of kids don't know about all the old hymns because we don't do a whole lot of them in here. But uh, that's some of the best stuff right there. Tonight at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary, you're going to hear that and a whole lot more. Lots of acting and camp walla balla. I don't know. Bring some calamine lotion just in case. You never know. Y'all stand up. We're going to worship this morning. I think the kids have done an awesome job at starting us off. But you know what? It's our turn. God wants us all to rejoice and to worship him. So that's what we're here to do this morning. Give him praise and thanks. And he is our eternal father. He is Lord of all. We love him. We can trust him. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. Oh, Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. Just tell him this morning, he's good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever.
thank you that we have that honor and privilege today, God, to lift our voices, to lift our hands and our hearts to you and say, God, you are so good. God, help us to call to mind all those good things. Help us to call to mind what you sacrificed for us, what you gave for us. And Father, help us to call to mind that you have never left our side, that you are always here, that you are always someone we can trust and rely on. We love you. We give the service to you today, Father. Just bless it, everything that is sung, that is said. God, use it to build your kingdom today. We love you. Everyone who longs for truth, needing hope and strength renewed, come and meet the Savior of the world. Everyone who longs inside, desperate for the words of life, come and meet the Savior of your soul. yesterday and the savior of my tomorrow god please redeem me restore me be mine lead my life then he's with you everywhere you go everything you do he is with you and you don't have to worry about it you know what and all he asks is that we honor him is that we worship him is that we recall those times when he is good we recall those good things remember and um, concentrate on those and ponder those we remember the goodness of the lord and it's easy 
in those hard times to say, we love you, Father. It makes it so much more easy for us as humans because, oh, things are hard sometimes and we don't feel like praising. But we recall how much he loves us. Your desire is going to be to tell him that I love you. I want my life to say that I love you. Have we put away those old things today? said no to the stuff that's holding us down and keeping us stressed and worried and bogged down. I'm, I'm talking to me. It's hard to do. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed. Son, to 
Jesus, we him today amen be seated what sweet sweet worship from our little ones up here early to the talent that God's given us on the stage we just are so thankful that we can be in this spirit of worship that we can be here on our Sunday to worship our Creator today we're going to continue to do that as our ushers come and they prepare to take our offering we've got tithes and we've got offerings that we return to God as a form of worship to show how much we do love him how much we trust him And we want to talk about what Psalms tells us, the book of Psalms, chapter 1 today, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And if we meditate upon the word of God, if we go by the principles that are in this word, then we're going to be givers. And when we're givers, God sees us as a conduit and not a reservoir. A reservoir stores up, but a conduit lets things pass through. And then believe me, you're not going to outgive him. And that is such a blessing to be able to be that kind of reservoir for the kingdom, to be able to help advance what the church is going to do here in America. So thank you for being faithful with your giving. Thank you for being so generous. Join me as we pray for our offering today. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we get to continue to worship you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the freedom that we have, for the blessings and the abundance that we have in America. And God, we just have this opportunity right now to bring a little bit back to show the trust that we have in you with the finances that you bless us with. So God, bless each and every one and return it to them a hundredfold. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. the train of his robe filled the temple and the angels gathered around and they cried you
männlich, ca. 1,60 groß. Die Gesuchte trägt eine hellgraue Jacke und einen großen Schal. Wenn Ihnen diese Person auffällt, verständigen Sie bitte umgehend das Flughafenpersonal. Und bitte. Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie zu den M24 Breaking News. Die Polizei bittet um ihre Mithilfe. Dringend gesucht wird diese Frau. Sie befindet sich seit gestern Vormittag auf der Flucht. Die Verdächtige ist ca. 1,65 Meter groß, hat dunkelblondes, lockiges Haar und trägt eine helle Jacke. Die Flüchtige gilt als unberechenbar und äußerst gefährlich. Bitte versuchen Sie nicht, die gesuchte Person festzuhalten oder gar anzuschauen. Für Hinweise zur Ergreifung der Verdächtigen wählen Sie bitte die unten eingeblendete Nummer. Wir melden uns wieder zu den Hauptnachrichten zu vollen Stunden. Bis dahin noch einen schönen Tag. Diese Frau. Sie befindet sich seit gestern Vormittag auf der Flucht. Die Flüchtige gilt als unberechenbar und äußerst gefährlich. Guten Morgen. Sind Sie gestresst? Wie sehen so gestresst aus? Da hätten wir was für Sie. Could you imagine being in that airport in that situation and you start seeing these things? That would stress you out a little bit, I would say. You'd have a little bit of emotional stress. You'd be a little bit ragged by the end of that, wouldn't you? That would be a bad place to be. Well, welcome to our series called Ragged today. We're in week four. We've talked about several things from physical to um, spiritual to financial, how we can be well-rested and not be so ragged in life. And today we're talking about emotions. And the next week on Mother's Day, bring mom, we are going to finish up with relational, how we can be more relationally rested. And I know that sometimes going to the doctor's office can be pretty stressful for us, can it? And that reminds me of a story I heard recently about a man who went with his wife to the doctor for a visit. And the woman went with her husband to see his doctor. After his checkup, the doctor spoke with the wife alone in the office. He told her, your husband is suffering from a serious, severe stress disorder, the doctor continued. Unless you start following immediately to reduce his stress, he won't have long to live. First, each morning, fix him a healthy breakfast. For lunch, make him a nutritious meal. Dinner must be an especially nice meal. Second, be pleasant at all times. Don't burden him with chores and don't tell him your problems, as this will stress him further. Most importantly, make love to him several times a week. If you can do these things for the next 10 months, your husband will recover from his stress disorder and regain his health completely and live. On the way home, the husband asked his wife to tell him what the doctor said, and the wife responded, he said, you don't have long to live. <laughs> Some of you laughed a little bit too loudly at that there now. I do, I do some marriage counseling if y'all need it, so come on. <laughs> this is the fourth week of our series, as I said today. We're going we're gonna to work on emotional stuff today. We're going to talk about what the Word of God teaches us about our emotions and how we can be more secure emotionally. And number one, let's start out with a definition. What is emotion? It's a natural, instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. As in, she was attempting to control her emotions instinctive or intuitive feelings as distinguished from reasoning and or knowledge. So we're dealing with a little bit different part of the brain today. We have reasoning, we have knowledge where you think, where you apply logic, but a lot of times our emotions don't follow that, do they? Our emotions can just be all over the place depending upon what we're going through and what our life is throwing at us. 
So we want to see how can we be more grounded. And I know that we have a problem with this in America. You can look all around. You can see the things that are going on with people emotionally. We have uh, mental health issues. We have all kinds of things that affect us in this society today. And Dennis Thompson of Health Daily, April 17, 2017, from CBS News says, more Americans are suffering from stress and anxiety and depression, the study finds, and more, more than ever are stress depressed and anxiety ridden. And many are unable to get the help they need, a new study suggests. An estimated 8.3 million American adults, about 3.4% of the U.S. population, suffer from, from serious psychological distress. An evaluation of federal health data concluded previous estimates put the number of Americans suffering from serious psychological distress at 3% or less, the researchers said. Mental illness is on the rise, suicide is on the rise, and access to care for the mentally ill is getting worse, said lead researcher Judith Weissman. She's a research manager in the Department of Medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City. This increase is likely a lasting after effect of the Great Recession that began in late 2007 a stress-filled time that caused long-term emotional damage to many Americans, Wiseman suggested. It's interesting that a lack of financial resources, they believe, led to a lot of this situation with folks because we can really elevate our finances, can't we? We can really look at the dollar and we can really put that as a goal and really chase that in America, can't we? We really see that as something that we focus on. Well, it's very interesting that you can go to other countries south of our border, you can go to Africa, to Zimbabwe, and you can see what's going to be on their mind. It's not going to be a dollar per se, but it's going to be a bucket that they can carry water that may be something that you wouldn't even wash your dog with here in America, but they're going to use that to cook with. They're going to use that to consume. They're going to use that for bathing. And then the beans and the rice and the flour and the hams and the different things, the cooking oil, the oats, all this, the sweetener, the lid on the bucket, that is incredibly important to folks in Africa. So I just encourage you Please help us with this uh, for Zimbabwe because we need to help these folks throughout the United Methodist Church. And there's so much that we can do for $25. It took me about 20 minutes and $25, and I filled that bucket up. And we got the buckets here. You can get them in the back. You can get them in the office. There's a list of what you need, I think, in the bulletin. I think Rhonda put that in there. And really, it's, it's, it's very little to us, but that's a tremendous amount to those living internationally who are struggling just to stay alive. They don't go to their refrigerator to find what's in there to eat. They don't look for leftovers, they don't have it. So that right there is gonna be a tremendous blessing. So please, if you can help us with that, I know every year you guys step up, this church does an incredible job helping send those buckets. We fill up a pickup truck load or more every year and take that over for, uh, for them to pack up and ship to Africa. So please, please help us with that. And then $5 for shipping, we'll, we'll take care of that, get it all over there. So for about $30, you can make a big difference in a family's life overseas. So please, please do that. But what does the Bible teach us? What does the Bible tell us about emotions and how we can be more grounded, how we can be less ragged, and how we can have that emotional rest? Let's look and see Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 10. And it's a different translation of the Bible. I love this translation. The New English translation says that we banish emotional stress from our minds and put away pain from your body, for youth and the prime of life are fleeting. So what does that tell me? That tells me that we have control. We have some control over what goes on in between our ears. And some strange things can go on between our ears. But we have to do what we can do to take control and banish that emotional stress. We've got to get it out. There's a lot of things we can do physically. I like to exercise. I love to ride my bike. I, I hate running, but I do it because I know that it's good for me. But there are things that we can do to help alleviate some of that stress. But we also need to do the things that are biblical. And you're not going to do much better than being in the Word of God and using that to renew your mind, as Romans 12 tells us. But I don't know if you know it or not, but we are in a spiritual warfare today, Christian. We have bombardment coming at us from just about every angle, from the television to the movie theaters. To I know nobody in here has one of these, do you? Anybody got one of your smartphones with you that you seem like you're glued to? Our uh, Sunday school class this morning, we were talking about that, how, you know, how hard is it to put that thing down and to walk away from the bad that's on it, there's good that's on our smartphones too. We all have our Bibles, if you have the Bible app. You can't uh, go anywhere without having that. That's a good thing. But then the enemy likes to take the things on there that can distract us, the things that are on there that can divide us, and he likes to, to utilize that. So we have to guard ourselves and guard what we're putting in here. A lot of what we put in here determines what our emotional state will be. But we have a battle daily 
and it's between our ears. In stressful thoughts, we have to decide how we're going to respond, how we're going to respond to others. A lot of times uh, that can be a bigger stressor than even what's going on between our ears, but what we deal with from each and every person that's around us. And we have neighbors, don't we? And who is our neighbor? Jesus says everyone is our neighbor, correct? I know a lot of times here I, I deal with things um, with benevolence that come and go throughout the church office, and, and sometimes Rhonda will be in her office, and she'll come in and she'll say, there's, there's a gentleman out here that, that I need you to talk to, and she's sort of almost winking at me, and I say, okay, and I come out, and sometimes these folks can be extremely difficult. Sometimes they are addicted. Sometimes they are going from church to church to church, working the system, and I have a background in law enforcement, so... A lot of times I really have to balance that because I am a protector. I'm a sheepdog. I'm always somebody that's going to be watching out for the flock. I want to protect anyone uh, from anyone that's going to come in and try to hurt someone or they're going to come in and try to take advantage. So sometimes those folks, most of the time, there's no problem whatsoever, but there are those times when they come in and they don't get exactly what they want because we don't hand out cash. We don't give cash to anybody. We'll take people and we'll, we'll buy some gas for them or we'll put them in a motel room or we'll get them something to eat. But sometimes that's not the answer they're wanting. And when I have to tell them no, sometimes they get belligerent. Sometimes they want to start cussing me and things like that. And then it's, it's all I can do. I, sometimes I have to uh, resist the urge to anoint them out the door quickly as my old law enforcement training. Now, confession's good for the soul, y'all. You can look at me mean if you want to. I know some of y'all have had some bad thoughts in the past week or two. It's not just me, right? You can, you can blame it on me. You can say, no, you're the only one. That's okay. But right now, you know, we all fight those different stressors. Whatever it may be, what's going on in your life, you take control of it. And that's what it says, banish emotional stress from your mind. Your first point today, as we look at your notes, the battlefield for emotional rest is fought primarily in our minds. So how do I fight that battle in my mind? I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about it. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians how to do this. Chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 in the English Standard Version, like this version too. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And that's your second point today. Paul tells us the key is taking every thought captive to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And if we can go back to that scripture, if you guys can put that back, up on the screens if you can go backwards I may have messed you up tremendously I don't know if they can do that can they go backwards there we go no not that far back one more come forward one on the scriptures go net go one more there you go one more there that's my fault I made it made it hard but we walk in the flesh yeah we're in these earth suits and then weapons of warfare are not primarily flesh sometimes they can be someone may come at you and try to physically punch you but a lot of times what's going on is what the spiritual world is doing. And you've got, the, you've got the enemy. He's sending out his minions, and they're trying to work on your mind. They're trying to defeat you. They're trying to make you broke, busted, and disgusted. They're trying to get you addicted. They're trying to do those things that are strongholds. If you see that, you have the divine power to destroy these strongholds, though, through the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit, through relationship. That's why it's so important. I don't know if you're in a small group. I don't know if you are in a Sunday school class in this church, but we have some incredible groups that meet here. Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, Wednesday at noon, uh, 55 and Rising, I think, is tomorrow at noon. We've got all kinds of opportunities. If you don't have somebody that you're walking with, come see me. I'd love to plug you in to somebody that can help you walk in this kind of authority to destroy these strongholds. But we destroy arguments, every lofty opinion, and we take every thought captive. That is so important. If you can take each and every thought captive, yeah, we all have terrible thoughts. We all have things that come into our minds, and you go, where did that come from? Why am I thinking that? You can't help sometimes what comes in, but you can help if you let it stay there, if you dwell on it, if you act upon it. That's what it means by taking every thought captive. You be the guardian of what's in your mind, and that will help you be able to rest emotionally. You guys get that? Take each thought captive. If you don't remember anything else today, take every thought captive and make sure that you guard what's coming into these, this gate of your mind and what's going to stay there. Cast it out. Sometimes we can't help what comes in, but we can help what you allow to stay there. Amen? Romans 12, I quoted it earlier. Let's look at this one. This is vital, so vital. I can't do it without this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God 
because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So number three, dedicate your body to God and let him transform your mind with the word of God. I can't do it apart from this. Christian, it's so important. Somebody talked about going on the Emmaus walk last weekend and how from Thursday to Sunday they didn't have their phone, they didn't have their watch, and they were so focused upon God. They were focused upon the word of God. They were focused on fellowship. They were focused on worshiping. And why do you think they do that? Why do you think Emmaus starts out with that and says no phone, no, no watch, and they cover the clocks up, they take them down around the church here? Because most people, unfortunately, aren't doing that. They're not taking that time on a daily basis to renew their minds, to strengthen the gates of your mind, to be able to take each thought captive. Because without the word of God, Christian, that's our sword. That's one of the first series I did here is I had the sword out here, scared everybody to death probably. Had the old Roman short sword, and I said, this is the weapon. That's what we use to fight back against the enemy. So if we don't know it, we can't use it. And that's like going into battle without your M16 or without whatever your, your weapon of choice is if you're in the military. That's why it's so vital. So second thing, remember, take each thought captive. And number two, renew your mind with the word of God. If you only take those two things out of here today, Christian, and you apply those, I'll be ecstatic. Take each thought captive and renew your mind with the word of God. Amen? Dedicate your body to God. Let him transform your mind with the word of God. And that's obedience. In a nutshell, that's obedience. When you know what's in the Word, number one, and number two, you do what the Word tells you to do and don't do what the Word tells you not to do. And I know in America today, a lot of people don't like to hear that. Well, the Bible says. They don't care what the Bible says. But we should, amen? We should stand strong. We should stand firm on the Word of God, and we should love well. We're not here to judge. We're not here to throw stones at anybody. Bring them in here. I'll tell them about Jesus. They get saved, the Holy Spirit will do the rest along with the Word of God. And we love them, we encourage them, we walk with them. That's what we ought to do as Christians. Until we are no longer in this earth suit and we take our last breath and we're standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. And then Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. God does not give you a spirit of fear. So if you struggle, if you've got this emotional issue and you're afraid, if you struggle and you feel like you don't have the ability to do something, if you feel like you're not worthy, if you feel like that, I can't do that for God, I've made this mistake, or I've done that, or this happened in my past, that's fear. That's what the enemy is trying to bring into your mind, to keep you right where you are, to keep you off the battlefield, to keep you from taking your sword and entering into battle. The enemy is a liar. That is what he does best. He's going to lie and try to make you not understand, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but a power love and self-discipline another translation is a sound mind i learned it first as the sound mind i think that's a good old king james version amen for god has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but a power love and a sound mind so when you have a sound mind you have self-discipline you can go forth and you can do a lot in this world because god is inside of you amen if you're a christian the holy spirit's inside of us the same power that raised jesus from the dead amen is inside of you let that soak in a second. We're not doing this by ourselves. Yeah, we're in this earth suits, and we make our mistakes, and we lose our temper, and we, we do whatever we do. But God. And when you've got but God on your side, you can do anything that he's called you and created you to do. As a matter of fact, he wants you to. That's why he created you. That's why you're sitting in these pews today in these seats, worshiping him. You're here to make a difference in the kingdom. So what is it that he has called you and created you to do? Your fourth point today, our faith gives us the power to be emotionally rested and power love and self-discipline. Now, these are some simple points. You don't have to be a genius to catch this stuff, but if you apply it, it makes you look like a genius. 
in, in, in the eyes of heaven. If you do these things, a lot of people, unfortunately, do not do these things. But talk, talking about fear, any of y'all ever afraid of anything? You afraid of snakes, bears, spiders, the dark? There's a, there's a lot of people afraid of the dark around here. I walk around this church Monday through Friday flipping lights off. I mean, it's just incredible. Be, there's lights on everywhere, and there's nobody in here. I'm like, what, is somebody scared of the dark? What's going on? But yeah, we all have fears. I'm not talking about a rational fear. I'm talking about irrational fear. Now, I have heard some stories about tourists and whatnot up in the Smoky Mountains, up around the Park Vista Motel, taking a box of pizza, going out and laying down in the parking lot where the bears are going through the dumpsters and whatnot, putting the pizza on their stomach and opening the box. That's not smart, folks. And the bear comes over and eats the pizza. Now, if that's true, I've heard it. I didn't see it. But if that's the kind of thing, that, there's something to be afraid of there. There's something to be feared of there when that big black bear is trying to munch down on pizza on your belly. I mean, don't be, don't be ignorant. I'm not saying you take fear out. God gives us healthy fear, amen. We want to we use common sense. Don't try that at home. Kids, front row here, don't try that at home. Our last scripture today, I'm going to be short, I'm going to be brief. Let's wrap this up. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. This is great. The fourth chapter of Philippians is another one of my favorites in the Bible. It is incredible. If you don't know it, get in there, study it, meditate upon it. But it says here, Paul to the church of Philippi, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. When we focus on the right things, when we get our minds right, when we take those thoughts captive, when we renew our minds on the word of God, when we don't worry about anything, but what did it say to do? Pray about everything. We can all worry. We can all get things in our minds. We can what if it to death. I'm sure all of us have grown up and you've, you've thought, what about this test? How am I going to do on this? I've got this interview. I've got this job appointment. I've got this meeting. And you can just get in there and you can worry yourself into a frizzy over something that by the time you go and do it, what happens? Most of the time, it was nowhere near as bad as what you anticipated, especially if you're prepared. You do what you're supposed to do. But don't worry. Pray. If we don't worry and we pray and we trust God, you're always going to have that peace that you can't even understand, that peace that passes all understanding. And your last point today, don't worry about anything, but pray and fix your thoughts on the word of God. And that's the key. That's how we're going to have emotional rest. That's how we're going to do the things that we were created to do. And we won't be defeated. We won't be distracted. We'll be able to take our sword and go out into battle and do what we need to do to fight against the schemes of the enemy. And he's a liar. He's defeated. Jesus has already taken the keys to death, hell, and the grave. It's all but done. He's got to just come back and, and start setting his kingdom up. It's all but over. We just have to hold on until then. Amen. We've got to be able to be the church here in America that we need to be. I know that I've had, I've had those thoughts. I've had those worries. I've had condemnation that's come in. And people, in my mind, it's not really people, but I think, think in my mind, well, I'm not worthy. How do I get up there and preach a sermon? I've done this. I've done that. I've made these mistakes. But God. But God so important that you understand no matter where you've been no matter what you've done no matter what mistakes it can be forgiven today that cross of calvary 2,000 years ago has more than enough blood was shed for me for you for anybody so today have you made that decision do you know jesus christ as your lord and savior have you said i am a sinner father forgive me of those sins if you've not today can be that day but Christian, what decision do you need to make today? Is there something that you need to do? Maybe you thought before, ah, oh, that's no big deal. I'm not going to fill a bucket up. That's sort of silly. But maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to you today. Maybe you see that bucket in a whole different way now than you ever have. Maybe you're going to decide today, I'm going to do that. Maybe you want to fill two buckets up. Why should I limit God, right? Why do, we, why do we have to be limited to $30? Some of you have got the ability and the abundance to do a whole lot more than that. 
Maybe you're here today and you've been fighting these things in your mind as long as you can remember. Maybe today you want to come to this altar and you want somebody to agree with you in prayer that no more, heck no, devil, go back to hell where you belong. I'm not going to do this one more day. And I'd be honored to pray with you. Maybe you've got something else going on, but whatever it is in your life, don't leave today without letting me pray with you. Let Ashley pray with you after the service. We'll stay to the last person today. But I just want every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. What's God telling you today? What's the Holy Spirit spoken to you? Through his word, it's not through me. I was the vessel. What decision do you need to make today? Don't just attend church. Don't let it just be a religious ceremony. Let the Holy Spirit do something in you today. Let there be a transformation. Let there be life change. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, if you died right now, you'd split the gates of hell wide open. Pray a prayer like this. If you feel the Holy Spirit's impressing this upon you and you're, you're tired of struggling, you're tired of being lost, maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're here. But say a prayer like this. Say, Father God, I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn 180 degrees away from the way I'm going. And I'm going to follow you. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, I accept your free gift of salvation. And thank you for my forgiveness. If you prayed that prayer today, you've got one more thing to do. You need to tell somebody. Make it public. We're all going to stand. We're going to stand right now. We're going to worship God in song. If you need prayer today, if you want to make that a public profession of faith, I'll be at the front. I'll give you a Bible. I'll welcome you to the kingdom of God. God bless you as you worship. Jesus, we Let me pray for you be dismissed. Father God, we just love you today. We thank you that you're such a good, good Father, that you sent Jesus for us, so that we could be the, uh, the rulers and not be the captives, God, that we wouldn't have to be in slavery to any thought, to any fear. But God, we can walk as conquerors, more than conquerors, through Christ Jesus. We're joint heirs to the throne of cross, to the cross of Calvary that you gave Jesus, God, that he's on the throne right now, and we're joint heirs to that throne. So God, I ask that you just go before each and every one of us this week, that we would be the light shining in the darkness, that we would stand firm on the Word of God, that we would learn the Word of God, that we would renew our minds, we'd take each thought captive, and God, that we would go forth and have no fear, that we would pray about everything. And God, let that love and that light shine throughout the city of Sevierville and surrounding areas. And we thank you for being such a good, good Father, for taking care of our needs, for giving us abundance and more than enough. So bless us to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.